We have two talks on uh, chat GPT use cases in science communication and dr drug synergy analysis. And first up, we have Ben Rush. And so Ben is a postdoctoral researcher on campus and a small business owner. He works in applied statistics and statistics education and is passionate about science communication where he is developing new ideas to combine generative AI and communication for scientists. So let's all give a warm welcome to Ben. Okay, can everyone hear me all right? All right, not too much, hopefully. Okay, sweet. All right, let's dive into it. So yes, I'm Ben, he, him, and I'm going to talk to you about the integration of science communication and AI. Uh, like Chris was saying, I'm super passionate about this, and I've been working in the realm of science communication, I think, I don't know, five, six years. I do science communication when I possibly can. I'm also out in the community doing storytelling, stand up, and I teach improv here on campus as well. So really trying to integrate all that stuff. Um, out of curiosity, anyone raise your hand if you would consider yourself a science communicator? Okay. Interested, people? Okay. Are you here for the AI? <laughs> sure. No, okay, all right, cool, good, good participation. Um, okay, so let's get into it. Uh, why is this concept of science communication even important? Um, interestingly enough, there's a recent poll, poll by Pew that was showing, and actually I have it right here, that there's a pretty large decrease in trust in science that we've had over the past couple of years. Thoughts of one, it being politicized, and then also some exhaustion from COVID with poor messaging that happened with that way. But generally the theme is, and I think this is the most important here, is people are tending to start to think that scientists don't really have the best interest in their, uh, the public's interest in mind. Um, so it's still not the majority and actually scientists are in the top three for trust of all different types of occupations, but it is slipping. And so, although you might not seeing or feel yourself as a science communicator, this is actually important because the words that you speak to people who are not scientists do resonate and have impact. Um, and then, of course, we've seen also, you know, what happens when people don't adhere to the best scientific advice. And there's recent pros and cons, but then it can lead to actual death. Um, you may also, like if you're writing grants, see that you might have to have more outreach efforts in your in NSF, NIH goals. Um, as you're going and becoming more uh, prolific scientists, you might need some personal branding and then so, uh, social media can help with that. Your science communication can help with that. Um, I also think it's generally pretty fun. It's pretty neat to go out into the world and show a kid like this cool new technology that's out there and they get excited about it. Um, and so you're kind of helping to grow the next generation as well. Um, I will s define communication vaguely here because I think it would probably vary from person to person, but it is essentially the fully effective way of transmitting some sort of information from one party to another. Uh, and I think in science, we kind of like I'm doing right now, I'm just giving you information and I'm hoping you're absorbing it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be the most effective way to do this. Um, also, I'm happy to share my slides if you wanna do this so you don't have to take pictures. We won't take pictures of you. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> That's my boss. So it, it's not going to be, I promise. Um, and so I, I would encourage everyone to try doing a little bit of science communication. Uh, there are people, we have a life science communication department here on campus, so you can actually take classes. And of course, they're not even on the same page of whether you should be fully trained to be a communicator or start doing stuff. Um, I'm in the doing stuff and getting it wrong and learning. Um, I'd kind of advise doing that too, but you could also see the potential if you have someone who is a poor communicator, maybe about CRISPR technology, AI, and saying, oh, don't worry, AI is not gonna take your job. And then if the recipient actually knows someone whose job has been lost due to AI or cut back, then there's gonna to start to be some barriers that way too. Um, and I think I also will put out key points here, and even for us scientists in the crowd, we all, you know, we try to be as logical as we can, but we are absolutely creatures of emotion. And so oftentimes I think we have the idea that the more information that we'll give to an audience, that's going to make them understand something better. And that is uh, not true. Uh, there is a deficit model, um, def which is a uh, kind of an intro thing for life science communication to say the more information that you give people, it's not actually going to help them. And sometimes if it's especially in 
facts, uh, let's say climate change, if someone doesn't believe climate change is happening, you give them more and more facts, you can actually make them more polarized and have stronger barriers. Um, so that's on an individual basis. There's also the idea that we're all social creatures and we care what other people think about us all the time. And there have been plenty of psychological studies that show even if someone witnesses a true thing happen in there, so maybe it's like the count of jelly beans in an office. If there's a group of other people that miscount it, but they're all aligned on the wrong number, people will fold. So we are not uh, completely logical machines. But that means we can also use different goals instead of just information to try to communicate people, uh, communicate with people. So I've got a list here, and I'll go through it briefly. I'm pulling this information from a very handy book called Strategic Science Communication. Um, this list will be important for the rest of the talk. Not that you have to remember it, but just say, I'm going to be using this list as science communication tactics. Tactics is a word I might use frequently. Um, so going through them, oftentimes I think when we are doing a talk like this, we generally like, I'm going to share my science. But that's not necessarily a specific goal. I might, as a more specific goal in this talk, say, use AI to help you with your science communication to actually establish tangible and understandable uh, publishing about your projects. Um, show integrity, don't lie, is basically what that means. Being willing to listen, which is, I think, sometimes a challenge for scientists. Also, just because of time, too, time constraints. Um, show warmth, be nice, empathetic. You can imagine if there's a scientist who's just always correcting people and like, that's not right, that's not right. They're going to start building those barriers between them and their, their crowd. Uh, connect on similarities instead of differences. Differences are okay, but try to go for where your Venn diagrams of different interests and identities can um, overcome and overlap with people. Show competence. I've got a couple letters after my name. That helps a lot, um, but showing that you've got past publications in the area will make you uh, expert and seen as valid. Uh, risks and benefits of whatever new technology, norms. You might see posters around campus that says like X number of badgers think it's okay to receive mental health services. As long as the majority of people are more likely to agree and then do that action too. Um, foster self-efficacy. So this could be like, I'm gonna give you all the facts. I think you are able to go sort this out yourself. I'm here for questions. I'm not trying to destroy your opinions. I'm not going to attack your identity. Um, you are able to do it. And I can be a referee if you need it. Uh, and then share emotions. Maybe sometimes how the topics make you feel. Um, stories are going to be a much useful, much more useful tactic than information, especially with people who might have dissimilar views than you do. So we got all this. We got all these emotions. We got these tactics. And then we have all these different ways that you can actually do it. And this is also not an exhaustive list. I think in the research bazaar last year, we saw some like science plus dance. I don't know how to do that. Uh, I probably never will. Um, and I don't know how to do all of this. I've done some podcasting. I've done the improv, some stand up storytelling, but I don't know anything about video either. So I'm presenting all this information, one, because I think it's good. You can follow up. But also, that's a lot of stuff uh, that you should ideally know how to do and then also do your regular job. And so you could take as many science communication workshops as you possibly could. You're probably not going to be an expert unless you're doing years and years of experience of it. I've been doing that, and I still don't necessarily consider myself an expert. It will be continual learning. So is this the place where we could have AI come in? Um, can we build different AI pipelines, prompting to help us translate what we need? So my goal in the in the next couple of examples is basically turn an abstract with my brain into a blog post. So trying to make a lens of whatever information that I feed to GPT uh, to try to get some sort of blog post at the end. The abstract we're gonna be using is actually from my undergrad. We uh, were using some machine learning techniques to predict muscle function. So just how well people can jump from body composition measures. So. Uh, like a quick x-ray scan. What does that actually predict muscle uh, function? Um, so she also won a poster, so shout out for her. Uh, she's not here, so I, I can just say all the nice things about her and uh, she, I don't have to worry about her getting embarrassed. Maybe she's online. So if she is, I hope you're embarrassed. <laughs> no. <laughs> 
Um, oh, wait, let's go to this first example. Um, okay, cool. So, uh, people who have used ChatGPT before. Okay, most people. People who have done it with placeholder variables. Ooh, okay, so this, okay, a couple. So this will be something relatively new, um, but we've all used data sets before. And so this is kind of, we're, we're just substituting in variables here. It's a useful technique. Um, so this is the prompt that I'm using. I'm giving it a role. So take on a role of a uh, science communicator with uh, 20 years expertise. So I'm getting high quality information, ideally after. Um, read the news or the latest new science from text. This is the placeholder where I'm going to put in information later on about the scientist. Um, and so then make a blog post, 250 words from the perspective of the scientist. And then also try to incorporate some of my interests from this placeholder variable. So this is something that you can do and swap out. Like I'm happy to give you this prompt. You can swap in your name, the text that you want to respond to. Um, I'm saying the scientist here is me. Uh, I have interest in storytelling, improv, science, communication, and the text is just copy and paste it from what the abstract is. I've also dropped in, uh, I think I said it in my prompt. Yeah, also read the CV. I've dropped in my CV below. It's copy and pasted, right? It's not the best formatting. It doesn't matter, machines can read it. Um, blah, 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 it keeps going, blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, so then I said, give me one line summary. So this is fine. And then the blog post. If you read it, it's okay. It's probably more for experts. It's pretty dry, um, but you know maybe with some tweaks, I could do it. It would also be a very fast turnaround time. Like if you saw something new you wanted to promote on social media, maybe for your own website, that's possible. And so let's see if we can get back this way. All right, but this is the same prompt that we'll try to use for other stuff too. So for those who want to pay a little bit of money, uh, ChatGPT with the subscription has an option of doing custom GPT. So you can kind of teach it a little bit more. You still can choose GPT-4 as your base model. I've done one uh, for science, I'm calling a science translator. It's public. If you have an account, you can link to it and play around with it. But I'm, I'm feeding it basically the list of all those principles that I talked about before and some other PDFs about trying to be an effective science communicator. Um, and I'm giving it the goal to always be empathetic and understanding whatever the audience is. So I'm trying not to be domineering or kind of a know-it-all. Um, and then this is what its output is. So again, same prompt. I'm giving it nothing besides the same prompt. I've, I've given it a little, little bit of information prior to, do, to doing this, and I'm happy to show you how to do this as well. If you're interested, blah, 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 CV stuff, blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, so then here's the blog post. Right away, it's a little bit more endearing. Hey, everyone, it's Ben Rush. It's not exactly how I would start a blog post, but that's okay. Um, and then going down, it's like actually a little bit more engaging, asking questions. Um, of course, you know, Everything that you do with ChatGPT is revolutionary. Um, I mean, we did solve everything by doing this abstract, but um, glad GPT is also agreeing with us. Uh, and then why does it matter? So it's actually really translating better to a crowd. So that's great. Um, maybe we can do even something better with these custom GPTs. I was like, you know, if I really want to get into the lens of me, oh no, did I lose it? Okay, cool. Um, I want to make a GPT of me. So then I created a new GPT. I gave it a lot of my storytelling uh, and comedy stuff that I've written up before. I gave it my CV. I gave it all the list of to do a good job of being a science communicator. And then I was like, okay, summarize me in 100 words. Uh, and this looks pretty promising so far. It's right. I've got a humorous flair. Maybe you've noticed that. Maybe you haven't. Um, and so I was like, okay, let's uh, have fun. Now yeah, we need an image. Um, so this is what it gave for me. Uh, I was debating whether to try to match this outfit completely. Uh, I do have the white t-shirt underneath. And I was like, I the only shirt that I have like this is short sleeve. 
So this is right to tell you, this is this is my biggest regret that I didn't stick to the bit fully. And I should have won that shirt regardless. So for that, my sincerest apologies. Um, but I hope you can forgive me. But regardless, good progress. I also just said, like, make a white guy with brown hair. So especially when it looks like that. Um, okay. So then what's a joke I would make? And in one of my storytelling things, I tell a story about working with a parrot. And he was mean. His name was Attila. And I make a joke that you could tell that he was an asshole because of his name, but also because he was obsessed with conquering Rome all the time, just like Attila the Hun. It kind of gets it. Uh, why is it named Attila? He was a real character, always fine and conquer Rome. So it's pulling that information. I don't exactly know how or when, but, you know, good progress. Let's see what else it can do. Maybe it can actually do the same prompt really by my uh, own lens. And then I disappeared. Which stinks. I got deleted. Uh, I think this is part of like the safety concerns because um, I could theoretically be impersonating someone else, right? But no custom GPT for me or for you at this point, sadly. Uh, but this is also a, a problem anyways because you would have to pay $20 a month to have a custom GPT, right? And then I have my science translator as public so we could share but you would also have to have a GPT uh, subscribed account, access to this. And when I've tried to pass on some custom GPTs with friends before, there's always a wait for signups. You don't always have access. So it's not a great way to do it, especially on the large scale, because I'm just doing one person's intuition for science communication each time. So then I was like, what if I could actually make some pipelines, uh, coding pipelines to do this? And I'm not a developer, so this was a fun new way to experiment with different things. It is a rough and ugly way to do it, but it kind of works. So what I'm basically doing is creating two forms, two databases to start with using Google. So Google form to the sheets. I've got a static profile about a scientist for so whatever basic information about the research. I copy and pasted my biography from WID's website, added my CV, copy and pasted that way pretty static. The second thing is a media request. So you could go on there and then ask, I want like a Twitter post, I want a blog post. It'd be really cool eventually to do grants. Oh, maybe that'd be money. Um, but you can just request whatever type of thing that you would want. And then by code, we take both that bits of information. I download it locally into my computer. I run a series of basically language chains. So I'm calling to ChatGPT uh, at this point, the GPT 3.5 turbo model, having it give me back a couple sentences, and then I'm mixing and matching with different variables from these different forms to then keep generating new media content. Um, and then eventually that's going to be spit out in an RTF file, rich text file, and then that could be sent to scientists eventually. Um, I've done it with, with me. Oh, and this is basically kind of just what the code looks like. So it's just like API calls, and I'm getting that response, and then saving them the responses as new variables. So um, this is like from the media request form, like what tone do you want to have? And then, you know, it could be warm and friendly tone. And then please write a blog post. If blog post was requested, if blog was one, um, et cetera. But I'm mixing and matching information from people's CVs and what to do uh, with that. So then the actual output so this is from uh, Word itself. We get different at this point, and I want to keep adding more stuff to it. Um, we get a refined story, research, uh, projects, hobbies, identities, people that want to highlight, extracting information from a CV. And then I think the most exciting part is media creation. So I can share basically what this looks like. And this is also open to everyone else if you want to see. Um, so I am getting... This is my copy and pasted biography from the WID website. Some of it's true, some of it's not. I don't, well, I shouldn't say it's, it's not true. Um, <laughs> it's, it's been updated <laughs> since then. <laughs> this is what I was hired to do. As we know, that sometimes changes. Um, I'm just telling a couple facts about me and then I'm rewriting that into a more concise story. Um, I am also having some revisions about my research, some revision, oh, and then, oh, this is great. A one-line summary of what we actually do, because we usually suck at being able to summarize stuff. 
Is it going to be perfect? No. But then you can start building from this without having to like spend 15 minutes to do it. And all that really adds up in time. Um, simple summary of my projects outside of work, uh, my hobbies, anything else I wanted to share about myself and, you know, like science communication, um, blah, blah, blah. This is also pretty neat that I'm able to extract information from a person's CV. So this is, it looks like basically a CV at this point, but I am copy and pasting someone's CV into the Google form and then having GPT extract that into new variables, which means I can start playing around with that later on, um, which would be really nice if I wanted to, I don't know, biographies and mentors that I've done in the past. Um, blah, 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 all these different sorts of things. Um, this is, uh, you can see here, like this is obviously made from GPT because the formatting is not perfect with some prompt engineering fixes that could be a list as well. Um, and then I'm trying to build something that's like, okay, we've got our standard categories of CVs. Like what about something that's not going to be in there naturally? Uh, so for me, because I feel like it's pretty important to put science communication and media experience, that's not going to be typical for everyone. People are probably going to, I don't know, uh, others. <laughs> besides this one i'm blanking on uh options right now um but then i can start reformatting and putting these into different prompts which is pretty exciting uh this is some ideas of how to do that it's not great at the moment um we also are probably asked many times to create different biographies um at different lengths for different conferences so we can do this um i don't think they're perfect because i'm just kind of proof of concept, can I get this all to work kind of stuff? But 500 words of me, uh, 300 words of me, 150, which is not 150 words actually. Uh, there's error on GPT that, that way. Probably also me with prompt engineering. Um, and then going back to the media creation. So this original goal of can we turn this abstract into a blog post? So I just had it print the original abstract. And then it did give me a blog post. Um, it's still pretty dry, which could be fixed with a little bit of prompt engineering here and there. But uh, now we have at least a little bit of a glimpse of this media quest coming and pulling information from the profile of the scientist and then spit out something that we can read. And this can be touched up for sure, but proof of concept is pretty is there. And so cool, that's great for you know one person to do it, but thinking since I can run this code at scale, this could be done for theoretically any department, any university, as long as people are kind of filling in some surveys that could be updated pretty frequently. So you are seeing probably your own departments trying to publish stuff about their scientists regularly to you know track potential grads, put it in newspapers, uh, alumni publications. This can be done at a faster way. I don't think it's going to replace it by any means, but I think it would probably get us to the 80% of the way there. And then that way, uh, people can just speed up the time and then use their thinking skills for uh, for even more projects. Um, all right, so that's a general output. Um, and then I, I played around with Dolly, more, more to come on image generation with that kind of stuff. Um, okay, so just in case the link wasn't working, boom, there we go. I would also love to know from you, what do you hate doing? What do you want to be automated? This is, I think, a two question Google form, if you want to do a QR code, fill that out. I also have my email address down here, if you want to let me know. I think to make sure you've got enough time, I'll, I won't have a conversation right now. But the slides will be available as well. Let me know. Let me help make your life easier. And then you can do the fun stuff that you actually like and not have to worry about pipelines about social media. Um, I have, do have some challenges still. I'm not a developer, like I said, so the like best and most efficient way to interact with API calls and stuff is new. I'm a statistician uh, more than anything else, but it's a fun world to play around in. Uh, definitely instant gratification if things work out. Um, I don't know how to work with the same person making multiple requests and timestamps. I think that gets a little bit tricky with database management. Also, since I'm downloading everything locally, that's not great. Uh, it should be somewhere in the cloud that you can scale. Um, I'm the limiting factor. And then, of course, Claudia, my boss, who likes to take pictures of me. Um, she has been very kind to let me do this. This wasn't necessarily my primary work, but I've done this for a couple hours here and there. Um, I thought about maybe trying to turn this into a nonprofit. I don't know. There has to be someone to actually like do this kind of work, but also a bit 
get compensated that way. So I don't know. Um, I will stop here. Um, I don't go like that or here. Um, any questions at this point? I'll probably take one or two just to make sure Jack has plenty of time as well. I will also get the ML plus coffee thing tomorrow morning in case you want to chat. I'll probably stick around here for a couple of minutes afterwards too. So if there's not any burning questions, I'll probably just pass it over. Oh, question. Yeah, uh, I've come from the background of being a science writer, oh, I'm yeah. a coding person. Uh, and one thing that I've noticed when trying to use a little bit of ChatGPT to write articles similar to blog posts and tools like that is that it uses an like, extremely inflated language uh, by default. So it's always like, this is not good, this is fantastic. And my concern on a lot of people who researchers using this type of technology is a loss of credibility to a higher rate. Everyone's gonna be saying that everything is amazing and a lot of people fall short of those expectations. So how can we navigate that, I guess, and uh, prepare other people that are gonna be using this technology and don't necessarily have the background to realize the concerns that that can bring up, how you know, how can we navigate that? Oh, that's interesting. So I think there's two parts there. One, how can I fix that in maybe in my own way? Um, and I've experimented with some prompts to say like, okay, be concise, remove filler language. How that would interact with kind of these ways of being empathetic and stuff, I don't know yet, but I definitely want to test that out a little bit more. The other one, I honestly don't know how much you could do to say like it's technology is revolutionary. Like the, the thing that I did before, our research is cool. I think it's going to have some cool impacts. Is it going to change the world? Probably not. Um, I think that's probably going to be on all of us and even just normal consumers to know this is a limitation of AI generative stuff in general. Hopefully they see the pattern. Um, I'm talking to some nonprofit consultants who are interested in AI. And they are seeing over and over beacon of light or beacon of hope in every single like grant that they're trying to do. It might just be some limitation that we get and then we edit it later. Um, and maybe I'll do this too. Maybe it's not so much on us individuals all the time to know, but maybe the companies are also making these large language models to have a better description to say like, hey, this could be inflated. Um, because there's there's so much stuff we always have to worry about already. Um, they can help out too. Okay. I think it's all a wrap. Cool. Okay. Next up, we have Jack. Uh, Jack is a computational biologist for the Stewart Computational Group at the Marbridge Institute for Research here in this building. And he specializes in omics analysis and is interested in harnessing large language models to interpret biological data and uncover novel insights. So thank you guys all for coming. Um, thank you to Ben too. That was a really insightful presentation about just how we can utilize this really powerful tool in a bunch of different use cases. And the use case I'm going to be talking about is sort of a wrapper um, around a text mining tool um, that we developed. And so I wanted to give an overview of the system first before we get into some of the specifics around creating a prompt or you know, around calling the API. So there is this tool that was developed um, by Ron Stewart and his team, IPI, uh, called Kinderminer. And what Kinderminer can do um, is read a stack of biomedical papers about 23 miles high. We have Mount Everest there uh, for reference. And so we're now looking at around 36 million abstracts. And these abstracts contain words, obviously. And these words, um, we try and rank uh, based off of co-occurrence, right? So, for example, pancreatic cancer, uh, if that were to appear 40,000 times in abstracts, out of 36 million. And um, we sort of blasted it against a list of genes, right? Which genes are most involved in either promoting or inhibiting pancreatic cancer? And we get back this list. Um, and this list represents sort of two terms that are very co occurred um, in PubMed abstracts. And so instead of reading the actual literature or, you know, reading 36 million papers, um, we sort of streamline this and we get back 
not directed relationships, but relationships between two terms. And we have an API um, that returns PubMed IDs. So these PubMed IDs represent the actual abstracts that these two terms appear. So here is an example output. Um, we use Crohn's disease in this example. So Crohn's disease in PubMed appears 45,000 times, about 46,000. Here are a bunch of B terms, or these are the terms that we are searching Crohn's disease against. And these are all bioprocesses, right? So we have intestinal inflammation, gut inflammation, disease activity. Um, some of these are more descriptive than others, but they all are linked through a series of PubMed IDs, which is over in column four. So this is all calculated using a Fisher's exact test um, sort of similar to a chi-squared, but you don't require, you know, 30, uh, a number of 30 for the co-occurrence itself. So we filter this by the p-value of the Fisher's exact test, and we get this nice data frame that we're able to put in pandas, we're able to parse out the PubMed IDs, and we sort of expect to learn some things between these two terms. And so in the next step of the pipeline, there are a lot of knobs that you can turn, right? So some of these abstracts only have 50 words. That's not a lot of information for a GPT-4 to process. So we can filter by minimum number of words in the abstract. We can also filter by the amount of B terms that we're going to look at given an A term. And we can also limit the amount of abstracts that an A term and a B term appear together. Um, and that's with the AB count right there. So it would cost Ron a lot in API calls if we were to evaluate 885 abstracts. So I try and keep my allowance to a minimum and usually use a maximum number of 10 or 20. <laughs> so PubMed um, has an e-utilities library, uh, which features an API. And this API, once we are given a list of PubMed IDs that two terms co-occur in, we're able to pull that. Uh, we're able to pull that system systematically, and we're able to um, feed it into GPT-4 calls with custom prompts. So thankfully, PubMed made it very easy to extract abstracts, um, given a list of information. And so we actually then um, inject a prompt into uh, an OpenAI GPT-4 API call. And so this is very similar to the call that Ben all showed you guys. I wanted to sort of dive into a couple of the arguments. So max tokens right now is sent to 512. So what that means is that is the maximum number of tokens that the output will generate. It's usually a good rule of thumb um, to say that 100 words equals about 75 tokens. But due to different compression techniques um, with the different models, for example, the turbo model of GPT-4 can take over 200 pages of text into an API call. And so there's some speculation around the compression techniques used. So in all reality, I can't say for sure, you know, the token to word relationship, but it's somewhere around one, two, three fourths. Um, as you see here, we have the prompt as the argument to the function. And so that's sort of alluding to, we will be using different prompts to inject different relationships via different abstracts. Um, right now I'm using the GPT-4 model, uh, the 1106 preview, which is a flavor of their new turbo, which includes this longer context length. Um, and, you know, just for a sanity check, you know, I've, maximum number of retries in which I can call OpenAI um, that we source from the config file. So I also prime the system, right? So instead of saying you are a helpful assistant, I think that's its default. I sort of give it a little information uh, regarding what I actually want OpenAI or GPT-4 to do for me. And right now, I'm really interested in we as a group are very interested in using GPT-4 as a classifier. So very similar to the placeholders uh, that Ben was talking about, uh, we use just F strings in Python. 
And so the B term and the A term that you guys are seeing within this prompt are actually the two terms that Kinderminer identifies. Um, and so we're actually able to iterate over the data frame. And so, you know, let's say we have 10 terms we're interested in regards to Crohn's disease. So we're actually able to inject the correct B term into the prompt and iterate through the entire data frame to explore multiple relationships sort of identified by this co-occurrence model. Um, and so by putting your prompt in a function, it facilitates creating prompt libraries almost, where you can very quickly choose between different prompts um, and you know choose between different formats of output, choose between different formats of classification. Um, and that's one thing I'm very curious from you guys, you know, how do we create adequate distances between these classification buckets, right? So I have a one to 10 sort of scoring system. Um, we actually don't want any tens. And I'll tell you why. It's strongly supported by multiple abstracts with a clear synergistic relationship. Well, if it's clearly identified in the text, then it wouldn't be novel. Right, that's not something we are necessarily interested in testing. That's something that's already been tested in the literature and discovered. So what we're really interested in is the seven to nines, right? Where GPT-4 actually, when passed in 10 abstracts, sort of does some synthesizing between the abstracts, right? Can we draw conclusions across abstracts using GPT-4 as a classifier? And you'll see from the results that it is somewhat promising, right? So in this particular example, I won't get into the biology of it, but we're looking at two genes and their role in pancreatic cancer, right? Specifically inhibition. And so you don't need to focus necessarily on the biology behind the rationale, but I thought the text highlighted in white was really interesting and something we're trying to get at, right? So we want GPT-4 to sort of provide synthesis across abstracts while giving a clear rationale, right? So BRD4 and Jack, um, they are in related uh, pathways and it scored it the relationship as a seven. So evidence of a potential synergistic relationship, but direct evidence of synergy in pancreatic cancer is not provided. This is great. This is the answer that we want. This is an answer or a relationship that we are interested in exploring. So it's really important when you are using these large language models um, to be able to reproduce your results, right? And this goes across you know, all domains of science. So in addition to returning um, the results of the API call, we also want to return the URLs of the actual articles um, that were used in the analysis, right? So we're not just, you know, pulling stuff out of thin air. If we ever wanted to go back and manually check the classification, we have the URLs, we have the abstracts, we have the publication years, and we also save the prompt, right? Because as we all know, using ChatGPT, you don't exactly get what you want the first time. So there's a lot of iteration that goes into building, you know, a, a valid prompt. Um, in addition to that, all the parameters used in the system are written out in a config file. And so if you ever wanted to reproduce um, a given classification task with GPT-4, uh, we give you all the tools to do so. So another thing that we were interested in is what if this was in its pre-trained data, right? These relationships or whether a drug was um, viable in treating a given disease. So I asked GPT-4 to give me some FDA approved breast cancer drugs um, from its last training of April, 2023. And so I'm interested in number six. Um, I'm interested in that because that was one of the first ones that GPT-4 uh, gave out because what I did is I put these in a list and then I basically would pick random drugs from this list. But the actual abstracts that I gave it, um, which is in the column AB PMID intersection, is actually just a randomly generated number, 
right? So this is anywhere between 10 million and 30 million because I thought the first 10 million abstracts were a little lacking in content. So I generated a bunch of random PubMed articles and I gave it a valid breast cancer drug. And so I was interested in seeing, will GPT-4 say that this is a valid drug even given text that doesn't support that claim at all, even though it knows. And so on uh, this white text right here, it's not referenced in the context of breast cancer. Um, I think I gave it you know, some random abstracts um, about HCV. And so even though in its pre-trained data that it knew it was an FDA approved drug, um, it, says no conclusion can be drawn about its effectiveness, usefulness, or potential harm in treating breast cancer based on this abstract. So this is a good sanity check, right? We know it's not just using its pre-trained data to draw the conclusions. It's actually looking at the abstracts and trying to draw insights from them. And so there are different, you know, sort of volumes of biomedical text that we can feed into GPT-4. We could feed it one abstract per call, um, but we rely on some summary statistics to sort of describe the entire relationship, right? It would be naive to say that one abstract could clearly define the relationship between a drug and disease, for example. So we have to use scoring sentences like is useful, is potentially useful, is harmful. And we have to assign numeric values to them and then use summary statistics to describe the entire relationship. Um, it also takes away from the inference and the classification power of GPT-4 of looking across abstracts, right? If we're only passing a single abstract at a time, maybe there's information that is lost that could be um, synergistically derived from feeding multiple abstracts. But also, it's safe to say that it's going to pay more attention to the context because there's a shorter amount of it the amount of attention that's gained through shorter context, it's tough to say. I don't think there's many statistics on that, but then we have multiple abstracts per call and we can use sort of a paragraph of rationale or quantitative methods like that scoring system to describe the relationship. Um, and when we need to uh, have synthesis in order to gain information, then it's necessary to feed multiple abstracts in. But we risk losing information in these longer context windows um, because as it's been shown, actually, I think you shared that with me, Ben, um, over 205 pages of context in this newest model. And I believe it was around the middle of the text that it stopped losing attention. So there was a study done, you'd ask questions on a given body of text and if you fed it 205 pages, it wasn't very aware of the information you were giving um, in the middle of that context window. So it's something to consider. And so these are uh, subjective by nature, but these are sort of three strategies I use um, in creating a good classification prompt. Uh, just specific definitions of task and output format are, I think, you know, good rules to follow when prompting any flavor of GPT. Um, and then this adequate distance between buckets of classification, right? How does GPT rationalize a 10 versus a nine versus an eight? So we have to feed it the words in order for these, you know, buckets to be equidistant from each other. We also need to ha handle edge cases, right? If there were only options for a drug to either inhibit or um, promote a given disease, and there was no option for you know ineffective or unknown or some of the these edge cases, if you will, um, you get these wacky answers by GPT because we're not giving it enough buckets to divert this information. In. So when creating a good classification prompt, it's also it's it's very important to have a null case, right? If there's no effect, if it's unknown, um, and that's something you should keep in mind when you know, making classification problems. And so I have a flavor of questions uh, for you guys because, you know, I don't claim to be an expert in this and the system uh, is, you know, the creation of it is very underway right now. So other than, you know, the breast cancer validation strategy, 
I was curious, you know, how do we determine if GPT-4 is a sound text classifier? Um, what are other validation strategies? You know, I think a root question of this entire analysis is, isn't abstract enough to draw relationships between two named entities? Um, can we trust manual labeling, labeling of relationships, right? Um, and if so, at what depth, you know, how many people's opinion do we trust to manually label uh, a relationship between two entities? Um, other than drug disease, you know, what relationships are worth exploring within PubMed? Um, and just general improvements for the system, right? Uh, I hope one day that this code will become publicly available. Um, I think it will. We might need to go easy on the API calls, but I'll talk to Ron about that. But yeah, no, I wanted to, uh, you know, ask you guys, and, you know, if, if you have answers to any of these questions, you know, I'm, I'm very curious. Yeah. Yeah, just to take us off for the improvements to the system, I'm wondering um, what the long sequence problem that you have, given in multiple abstracts, could there be an iterative, iterative process where you summarize abstracts and then feed it into the model? Try, try to reduce the invention of the abstracts first. Right. Yeah, I think that's um, it's a really interesting approach. I haven't thought of that yet. Um, you know, if you can do it in a way, right, where you can press the text but not lose you know, much of the, the information within it. I think that's a very sound strategy and definitely one, you know, worth looking into. Might be hard with abstract if they're so condensed already, but. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. yeah. So for the validation strategies, like what if you were to use something like, per se, breast cancer, um, something similar to breast cancer, but not like doesn't specifically talk about breast cancer, like some other cancer, like ovarian cancer maybe, or something else. So it's the same terminology, the same kind of like abstract, but completely different at the same time. So instead of generating random abstracts to validate, generate very similar yeah. abstracts. I think that's really, and th that would validate it a lot more than, you know, I think it was HCV, right? I, I think the similarity between the two um would definitely validate this more thank you for that yeah sometimes in data analysis you want to use multiple software like you know because they have their own limitations so what if you were using another llm so you you use chat gpt now there's gemini and there's many other ones so having two different ones maybe the meta you know to see if it behaves in the same similar manner, or right? You know what I mean? So, like, compare two, two, two approaches independently, especially for the quantitative labeling methods. You know, actually comparing the scores given the same prompts across two models. That was abstracts are not always a summary of the data, right? There's a lot more data in the results section, mm -hmm. but you know you're not capturing that. Right. Yeah, no, um, that's a very valid point. And I think if full text was as easy to retrieve as abstracts, you know, abstracts were a very low-hanging fruit to um, you know, sort of build this system around. But you know, I think it's hard to disagree with the with the fact that the results do contain, you know, a lot more information about the paper itself. So that's definitely worth looking into. Uh, the difficulty with that is that not all papers are organized in the same way. Right. right. But I, the question I have is, is there another source of summary of papers other than abstract? Do you, there's a, so you can get uh, some number of million full text articles, but there's 36 million abstracts and there's five or six million that are available as full text. So part of the reason we haven't approached that is that all the Kindermeyer and Skin, the other algorithms called Skin that we've been using are based on looking at all 36 million. And so the statistics, statistics we'd have to really think about is if you're doing co-occurrence just across abstracts with some of them, but across 
everything across others, then that gets a little confusing. And as you say, there's uh, the different papers are organized to stuff like that. So the co occurrence step, which Jack talked about at the beginning, is going to be more challenging if you go out to full term. So, but if we if we had good ways to get at full text for everything, I would love to do that. Uh, so if you have access to full text, would an intermediary intermediate step would be to create a summary of the paper before mm -hmm. you provide it to that? Yeah, that's especially important based on what Chris was saying about context link and what Jack was saying about the stuff in the middle getting long. We're not at 205 pages probably most of the time when you're patching in just 10 abstracts. No, no, that's past my allowance. Yeah, but if we, <laughs> if we, uh, if we were to get uh, full text, then we might want to condense it. Back. But def definitely trying. I mean, the new one, Gemini, has been out for three days, right? And it's free for now. <laughs> I tried it three days. Yeah, I thought that there was some controversy about Gemini, wasn't there? Like it was being overstated as a how to create it actually was. The model that seemed to be better than GPT-4 is not actually out, not the one that you could work with, because they're ultra. Mm -hmm. And then they distorted a lot of the presentation of it too. But I was going to say too, like, I don't know if you've worked with GPT-5 to try to do the classification, but it's just like, mm -hmm. I don't use it in my API calls because it's, I don't use GPT-4. 600 times more expensive. Mm -hmm. Llama 3, which is like similar performance, it's 3.5. It's got a little better of what I can see. It's even cheaper. So I've even thought about switching over to Llama 2. Um, but it could save a lot of money. Uh, maybe. Yeah. This experiment might not be worth the edit. I'm wondering if you try to annotate the abstracts with different labels, like this is a result statement, this is a question statement, um, this is a prior knowledge statement. If you could just annotate it and then feed it into the top, I wonder if it would be better, you could add that annotation to that insert it. The model has to do less yet, so it's try to interpret the abstracts. And I really don't think that's too much out of work. So I think that has some label data set to check it. That's right. Probably, you know, yeah. Yeah. So um, I did one. see, a question in the corner. Do you do you still have your question? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh you. no, no. Um, yeah, I'd I'd love to. Oh yeah. So I had, I guess, two annoying suggestions. So the first was adding on to his idea that I've been really interested recently in this method called random augmented retrieval, and maybe that's what Chris was talking about. But basically, how the method goes is it takes everything from your 30 million abstracts, pass it through a text embedder, put it in a vector database, do a vector search with added context from each paper. So you could add in the full paper, add in all the context from each paper, have them in this embedding format, and then you could do a search to search like, oh, these are like the vectors that are important in this new embedding space. And then you take those embeddings and then you pass them into um, uh, your chat GPT, like you decode them, then you pass them to right. chat GPT, and then you have the exact context you need yeah. with all the added context. And that's what like the BARD model is doing and what like a lot of these, like there's like new AIs on all the, all of these, uh, it's called Kappa AI. They use it on these like, uh, documentation pages for Python packages. Mm -hmm. That's what those are doing, because then you're restricting your output only to things that are in your vector database. Right. So that's like a new thing, I feel like. I haven't, like, I want to do it myself, but with this new, with that library called Langchain. Yeah. You can do it super quick. You can just, like, throw in your vector database, throw in the model you want to appear it's on, one, two, three, boom, call it a day. So that might be like an option you could try. Like, I don't know if that's going to work for your problem. Right. Um, but for validation, like, I don't know, just wouldn't you have to, aren't you kind of just like, I, I feel like, don't you have to just kind of make like a database yourself, like not a database, but like a validation test yourself and just like see how well ChatGPT does, or how well your method does on that. And Right. It's like, that's like all you can really do. I don't know. It looks like a lot of work, but like, I feel like that's kind of like your only option. 
at at some point, you know, you do need to investigate just manually labeling. You know, yeah. how how would you classify these papers yourself? Um, I think it's some semblance of ground but, truth. But is, hasn't this been like an explored problem? Like, doesn't like um, Mark Craven yeah. out of um, BBS doesn't he do this kind of stuff too with like finding relationships between text and abstracts between like drugs and so like, there has to be some sort of already validation strategy already set up. Right. Yeah. No. Um, try copying that. I think that's uh, I think that's a really good idea. I'm also interested. You know, if you're going to the coffee tomorrow, I'd love to chat more about vector databases. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, we can. I can't do this week because I have to do a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we can chat later. Okay. Jack yeah. didn't get a chance to talk about it, but he has done some stuff where we have manually annotated drug disease beers. And so then we have we've done some validation in that. And that's so, up, yeah. It's hard. Yeah, Mark has done a bunch of this kind of work, and we need to probably chat with Mark about some of the things that he's done. You can never you can never get enough data though, so that's hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have another question. Uh, the, the model like the Yama two model seventy billion mm -hmm. from Meta is available. Mm -hmm. So could you install it on a semi you know, a computer in your lab with a, a couple of GPUs and have your own? And you don't have to worry about tokens and you know how much it costs to run that. Right. Um, and the seventy billion flavor of Llama two does compare somewhat comparable to GPT four. I think um, as of right now, all the all the benchmarks I'm familiar with, GPT four still outperforms even the seventy billion parameter model but you know especially if we're going to scale this i think that's definitely something you know we should look to minimize api costs you know and we've talked about fine-tuning as well and that's a strategy to get to there great well we're kind of after to go thank you thank you thank you guys